think you could probably take a stab at that, but first I want you to do this. Take your copy of God's Word, however you have it, whether it's a traditional book like this in your hands or whether it's that device, that phone or iPad, something you read God's Word on. Take it in your hand and now lift it up. Would you do that? Everybody that has a copy of God's Word, lift it up. Repeat after me. We don't do this every week, but this is a good thing. Say, this is my Bible. Bible. It's God's perfect Word. I believe it. I will read it. I will obey its teachings, and I will share its truth. In short, that's the message of Jesus as we continue the Sermon on the Mount today. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I just want to say thank you for this day. Thank you for putting breath into my lungs today. I declare what I read in the Psalms early this morning. You are good and you've done good. And that's true even this day. Lord, we've had a wonderful time praising your name. The prayers we've prayed together have touched our hearts. And now we open your word. Perfect and true. In the scriptures you tell us that the word pierces to our hearts and really Lord that's what we would pray for. That you would move this servant out of the way using him but speaking through him. Lord giving us what we need that we we don't yet have. Teaching us new things today. Making us different today. And so, Lord, that I may not get in the way, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you? And as I've prayed privately, God, I I pray just for your special touch so that these important truths may impact our lives. And most of all, Lord, I pray that today someone would pass from death to life. That someone would experience what it means to know you in a personal way, Jesus, in a powerful way. Lord, that someone would be saved. So would you do this, Lord, for our good and for your glory? And would you do this in Jesus' name? Amen. Matthew 5 tells us that Jesus went away with his disciples. He he went to a mountain there in Tiberias in that Galilee region overlooking the Sea of Galilee. A crowd began to gather there. They had already started to follow Jesus. And, And Matthew tells us that Jesus taught his climbing companions. And he began that message with these words. He says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For theirs, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who thirst for Justice and hunger for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those who heart are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus begins with these blessings These things that bring fulfillment in life. He's telling them what he would later tell them very specifically. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly and overflowing. And this is the pathway. That word blessing means nourishment or a life-giving sensation. And Jesus was saying, if you want to live this disciple's life, If you want to know the pathway to truly experience life, this is it. It begins with this moment of salvation that can be called justification. It continues as you grow more and more into the image of Christ. It can be called sanctification. And one day it will culminate as you see Jesus face to face in heaven. And we call that glorification. After he gives these blessings, these challenges for how we live... He begins to tell us what to do. 
And he begins by reminding us that what we do always flows out of who we are. Need I remind you of that today? Identity always precedes activity. Activity, even spiritual activity, void of that spiritual identity, does nothing but bring glory to ourselves. So Jesus says, you are light. You are salt. So get out there and make a difference. Season the world around you. Shine in the world around you with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So so last week, I reminded you, man, in ourselves, the natural us, we're a mess, aren't we? Let me see your hand if you're a mess. Yeah, you are. You should be raising your hand. You're, we're a mess. We're, we're broken people. But, it, but in a moment like this, we've come together. And together, if, if you could just see my view, we, we're creating this beautiful mosaic designed by God. Broken things for His beauty. But He didn't really, He didn't destine us just to come together, Right? He wants us to get out into the world. That's what he's saying. You're the salt. You're the light. Let your light shine so that others can see your good work, so that the Father in heaven can be glorified. And and so last week we learned there's ways we can do that. We can meet people's needs. We can heal people's hurts. We can share God's word in Jesus' name in such a way everywhere we go every day that our Father in heaven is glorified. And the world is different around us. And I know you. (laughs) Because I've hung out with you all my life. Whether or not you specifically. People like you. And we hear a challenge like that and it's like, yes, let's go get them. I'm ready to take on hell with a water pistol. Let's go, pastor. I love it. Amen. And then it sinks in. And we say, but how do we do that? How do we... How do we truly live as salt and light at at school, at, at work, where we live, where we play? Jesus begins to answer that. He begins to show us how we do what we think is impossible. And that's where we pick up in verse 17. So let's read the word of the Lord. It says, do not think. And as I read that this week, I thought that would have been a good place to stop, Jesus. But what he's telling us is that he knows that's what gets us into trouble. When we have our wrong thinking. Jesus is beginning to address wrong thinking. He knew his followers would constantly struggle with the balance of what was old and what is new that he represents. What was the law and what is this new way of grace. Man, for 2,000 years that wrong thinking has been a challenge in the church. But not just on those issues. So we we could spend all of our time here. Remember, Jesus could have just stopped. Do not think. But we won't do that. But let me just challenge you. Are there areas of your life where there's wrong thinking? Go go down the list. Relationally. um, Vocationally. Financially. Spiritually, most of our problems come from wrong thinking. So Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So after his blessed introduction... After this bold summary, you are salt, you are light, Jesus begins to hit us right between the eyes. You really want to understand what this is all about? 
you, you really want to get this? Then hear these words. It's another familiar passage out of the Sermon on the Mount, particularly the phrase that was a part of these verses. I've not come to abolish or destroy the law, but to what? Fulfill it. Fulfill it. That, that's a common part of this message. It's also the beginning of a way of teaches, teaching that Jesus is going to use that we'll call the antithesis. And in just a moment, he's, he's going to say, you've heard that you shouldn't murder, but I'm going to tell you, and then he kind of gives us a different way of looking at it. Or, as he's just said, a different way of thinking. You've heard that you shouldn't commit adultery, but I say to you, mm, there's more to the story than that. A different way of thinking. You, you see, this thinking, this way we think is at the core of our faith. That's why the word that describes a turn to Jesus, repentance, is a word that means literally a change of thinking. I think I'm in charge of things. I think I'm the ruler of my own world. I think I'm in charge of my faith. But then I see my sin for what it is. I see God for who he is. I, the word in the Bible is metanoia in the Greek. I repent. I have a change of mind, a change of will, a change of thinking, and I follow him. Jesus said, I don't want you to think the wrong way. And so in this case, he begins to tell us how we should think as a follower of Christ. He changes the way we think. I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. Why would he say this? Well, obviously, there were some people thinking, Woohoo! Jesus came to abolish the law and the prophets. We don't have to do those things anymore. There's a new way. Now, I want to break this down in just a moment. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you four statements. I'm going to explain them, and then I'm going to illustrate this with, with a well-known person in Scripture. But first, I want to give you this sermon in a sentence. So if you check out, I hope you won't, but if you do, the one thing you need to walk away with. In a world filled with chaos and confusion, Jesus will always be enough and the scriptures will always be sufficient. Let me say that again, that's pretty big. In a world filled with chaos and confusion, Jesus will always be enough and the scriptures will always be sufficient. So what was Jesus saying? He's dealing with an issue we could call continuity. So when I look at the scriptures, is there continuity between the Old Testament, what we call today, and the New Testament that tells us the story of Jesus and how to live our lives in light of Jesus? Already, as Jesus began his ministry, his followers were wondering about that continuity. And it's a question that, that still consumes a lot of people in church today. Does all of the scripture apply to me? Or do I just take what I want? I've been in church all my life, and it seems like some people think not all of Scripture is inspired, but that they're inspired to spot the spots that are inspired. That's not the way it is. You've got to decide what you think about Scripture in light of what Jesus clearly thought about Scripture. Should you care about the Old Testament? This came to light recently by one of the more well-known pastors in our country. His father may be, recently deceased, may be the most well-known pastor right now in the world. His name was Charles Stanley. The son's name is Andy Stanley. And for the last several years, he, he's really led his congregation to think that, you know, the Old Testament is not that important. That really we should be, he used this phrase, unhitched from the Old Testament and just focus on the New Testament and, and the resurrection of Jesus because that's what changed things. And he's right in that sense. It's the resurrection of Jesus that changed things, but he's missing a big part of what Jesus said in this greatest sermon ever preached. But apparently some people were saying that even in the early days of Jesus' ministry. So listen again to what he said in response. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So what's he talking about? If you have your copy of God's Word, if you open it up in the beginning, it begins with Genesis. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, our Jewish friends refer to that as the Torah, which is the law. In the Torah, in those first five books of the Old Testament, we find the laws 
that governed the children of Israel, the followers of God. In the Old Testament, we also find some wisdom literature. Wisdom literature like Job or Psalms or Proverbs or Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And then we find a lot of books that are prophetic. They're written, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, by prophets who lived at a certain point in time, and they were the mouthpiece of God. They spoke for God. Prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, or, or what we call minor prophets when we look at them in the Bible, but these were major men of God, people like Micah and Malachi. So what was Jesus saying? He was telling us what he thought about the Scriptures. He was saying what we call the Old Testament now, what they would have called simply the Scriptures or their Bible, he was saying, it's not out of date. I didn't come for you to throw it away. It still applies. And this is important because I want you to understand that your view of Jesus is directly related to your view of Scripture. Let me say that another way. Your view of the of the living Word of God. Jesus is going to be directly related to your view of the written Word of God, the Bible. So let me give you those four statements. The first one is this. Jesus reminds us of the primary person in Scripture. (laughs) Now, sometimes I just like to throw you a a softball. I I try to make it real easy when I ask questions. I really think 100% we can get this right. Uh, Jesus reminds us of the primary person of Scripture. All right, let's get ready, class. Who was the primary person of Scripture? Jesus. Yeah, he's talking about himself. This is a bold statement. This is the kind of thing that would eventually get Jesus nailed to a cross. People did not like the fact that Jesus said, I'm that guy. I'm the one everybody's talking about. I'm the one that the Scriptures promised. Now, we know that because over and over again in the New Testament, we have this phrase. Listen to this phrase. These things happened in order that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. The New Testament writers say that over and over and over again. These things happened in order that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. So how does Jesus fulfill the Scripture? Well, he fulfills it by his life. His very life fulfills the scriptures. And the prophets, the prophets, man, they even told us where Jesus was going to be born hundreds of years before he was born there. His death. If you read Isaiah 53, the prophet tells us in passage, we call it the suffering servant. He describes how Jesus is going to die. His resurrection is prophesied. And then his teaching is fulfillment of the law. That's how he fulfills the prophets. How does he fulfill the law? He obeyed every one of the laws. He's the only one who's ever walked here who did. He never sinned. He followed the laws of God. So when Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law, he did it perfectly. Everything that was ever said that would happen of Jesus either has happened or it will happen when he returns. So I want you to think about something before we go any further. This book, man, it's not a science book. When it speaks to science, like long before scientists discovered it, the the word talks about our world being round. Did you know that? So when it speaks of science, it's accurate. It's not a history book. But when it speaks of history, it's accurate. It's not a book about man or woman, even though there are a lot of stories about men and women. This is his story. And it has been from beginning to end. Let me see if I can illustrate it. In Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's our cloud by day and our pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's a prophet unlike unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and our lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. Are you guys out there, church? In in Samuel, he's a trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, 
Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of the broken down walls of our lives. In Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he's our day spring from on high. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he's the lover of our soul. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the righteous branch. If I were hearing this, I would be getting excited. In Lamentation, he's the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, He's the faithful husband married to the backsliding bride. In Joel, he's the baptizer of the Holy Ghost. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he comes mighty to save. In Jonah, he's our resurrection hope. In Micah, he's born babe in Bethlehem. In Nahum, he's the avenger of the Lord's elect. In Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist. In Zephaniah, he's our savior. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's the fountain open for uncleanliness. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings from Genesis all throughout the Old Testament is the story of Jesus. He's Abel's sacrifice, Noah's rainbow, Abraham's ram, Isaac's well, he's Jacob's ladder, he's Moses' rod, he's David's sling, he's the bright morning star, the lily of the valley, the fairest of 10,000, the rose of Sharon, he's the honey in the rock, the desire of the nation, he's my wonderful counselor, he's my everlasting father, he's my mighty God, he's my prince of peace, the government upon which I rest my life, he's the Messiah, he's Jesus, the son of the living God. This is his book. The story was written about him. And it's all for his glory. So Jesus thought it important to remind any who would follow him who the primary person of the scriptures is. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus reminds us of the perfection of scripture. This is the perfect word of God. You can trust the scriptures. If you don't trust the scriptures, you won't use the scripture as the filter through which you look at everything in your life. But if you understand that this is the perfect word of God, you would begin to realize you can't make any decisions in your life without seeing if they line up against the scriptures. And I'm not sure there's any truth that can be more relevant to a parent, to a grandparent, to a school teacher, to a college student than these truths today. Because if this is the perfect word of God and it applies to every aspect of my life, then I don't make decisions about how I go forward based on how I feel or based on how my family has been affected. I make decisions based on the perfect word of God. That's what God's word claims of itself. In Psalms 18 and verse 30, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. In Proverbs 30 and verse 5, it says, Every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. In 2 Timothy, Paul describes it in this way in the New Testament. He says, All scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want you to think about this. This book, the Bible, was written over a period of about 2,000 years by 40 different authors from three continents. They wrote in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Those facts alone make the Bible one of a kind. But there are other details that defy explanation. It was written by shepherds and kings and scholars and fishermen and prophets, by a military general, a cupbearer, a priest. That's who penned these portions of Scripture They had different immediate purposes for writing. Some were recording history. Others were giving spiritual and moral instruction. Others were pronouncing judgment. They composed their works from palaces, from prisons, from the wilderness and places of exiles while they were writing history, laws, poetry, prophecy, and proverbs. And they laid bare their personal emotions. They expressed anger and frustration and joy and love. And yet, despite all of this, Despite this marvelous array of topics and goals, the Bible maintains a flawless consistency. It never contradicts itself or its common theme. God's Word is perfect. Now, our heritage, our legacy as a church is, is from the Baptist faith. That's our tribe. 
And in the Baptist faith, we have a document called the Baptist Faith and Message that speaks to what we believe about the Word of God. I want to read that to you because you just need to understand this is going to guide everything we do and the decisions we make. Here's what it says. The Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which a human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All Scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. Now, why am I saying this? Jesus says, don't for a second think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come that they might be fulfilled. And then notice what he says next. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus was saying, you need to be very careful about thinking that, hey, maybe this part of Scripture doesn't apply to me. Maybe, maybe that part of Scripture doesn't still work. <laughs> when I was growing up, I remember seeing bumper stickers, and my mom's here on the front row. And I have to tell you, now, when I was growing up, we had a big old Ford LTD. And I don't know what they were thinking, but my parents let me ride in, up in the back window of that Ford LTD. I'm still alive today. Parents today, man, you see them strap children down, it's like they're getting ready to launch them to the moon or something. I mean, nothing could move them. I survived. But I remember being in the back of that Ford LTD, and I remember seeing this bumper sticker. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. And that's a good amen at a Southern Gospel concert. But it's not right. It's got one too many phrases. Because here's the truth. God said it. That settles it. What I'm suggesting to you, though, is that when you believe God's Word, like Jesus believed God's Word, it changes your life. So just to sum it up, Jesus didn't say, hey, the law served a purpose. I'm glad we could use the Old Testament for all those years. But now there is a better way, a new plan no, what he's saying is this new covenant that I'm going to introduce to you, it's just going to make you hunger and thirst for righteousness more than you ever have. So stay tuned. Jesus reminds us of the person. He then reminds us of the perfection. And then he reminds us of the importance of practicing and teaching the scriptures. Look at verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do you see those two words? Practices and teaches. This is where Jesus gives us the how. Remember... You are salt. You are light. Get out there and season the world around you. Get out there and shine. Don't put your light under a bushel. But you let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. But, but how, Jesus? Practice and teach. Do the things that you know to do. Now let me make this real practical. First, I think Jesus was saying, you need to know the scriptures. You need to know the scriptures. If you want to know how the Bible speaks about itself, the word of God, go read the longest chapter in the Bible. It's Psalms 119. I read it this morning because it was one of the five songs in my daily reading plan. 
Psalms 119, over and over and over again, it, it reminds us the importance of the Word of God. But one of my favorite verses is Psalms 119.11. Listen to what it says. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Actually, my mom taught me that and a bunch of other children, she taught that while we were in Bible drill when we were a child. And we were learning and memorizing scripture verses. And I memorized it in the King James. And it it sounded something like this. I've hidden thy word in, in, in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What does that mean? When you have God's word deeply ingrained in your life, then like Jesus, when you face the temptations of the enemy, you're going to be able to say, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't live by bread alone, big guy. See, when you hide God's word in your heart, you're prepared to take on the challenges of the world. So I just want to ask you, how are you doing with your scripture memory? I I suspect most of us are not doing that at all. In the New Testament, it's it's put this way, 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed who correctly handle the word of truth. Does that describe you? See, I think one of the problems of the church and the world is we face these cultural issues and we know deep within us that doesn't seem consistent with God's word. It doesn't seem like it's right. But we don't know what to say. So we walk away with our tails tucked and we are ashamed workmen. And we're not salt. And we're not light. So I don't want to just beat you up and not give it practical help to you. So let's do this. I want us to memorize a verse this week. Now in our church, we're constantly calling you to commitment. This is the first one for today. So I'm about to ask you, get ready. You're either going to sit on your hand or you're going to step out in boldness. All right? How many of you would say, I'll take the challenge, pastor. I'm going to do my best to memorize this verse with you this week. Let me see your hands. All right, it's a pretty good showing. I think the majority wins. All right, here's our verse. It's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. I picked an easy one. When I felt like God was leading us to do this, I wanted something that everybody could relate to. So here it is. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All right, let's say that together, just for repetition. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, when my mom was teaching us in Bible drill, if we knew the verse, if we had memorized it, we would step forward... And the uh, first thing we'd have to do is say the reference. So I'd have to say Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then we'd say the verse. The verse was, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you a rest. And then we'd say the reference again, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. So I want you to learn the reference because otherwise you're going to be comforting somebody in your little corner of the world with this. And you're going to say, you know, the Bible says that when you're burdened and when you're weary and when you need rest, you can come to Jesus. And they're going to say, really? Where does it say that? And you're going to go, Oh no. So let's do it that way. Let's say the reference, let's say the verse, and let's say the reference again, okay? Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Take a screenshot, do whatever you need to do, write it down, lipstick, Crayola, mascara, remember it, and let's learn that verse this week. But... It's not enough just to know the scriptures. Do you know that? You see, again, I'm a nerd. I've been hanging out in crowds like this all my life. We got a lot of knowledge. For most of us, knowledge is not the issue. For most of us, we're not practicing it. And and so here's a way I would say that we're educated beyond our obedience. I mean, some of you've got Sunday school, perfect attendance pins. I mean, you're at church all the time. You can check off the boxes, but you're not living it. And I just need you to know today, just write it down. That's a transition. I'm committed to taking this church through. For too long, we've celebrated just partially what we should be celebrating We've kind of decided that you're a perfect church member if you show up regularly and if you put something in the offering plate and maybe if you find a place to serve and and those things are great, but all of that takes place here. 
The disciples' journey is not simply about what you do when we come together for an hour and a half a week. The disciples' journey is about what you do out there. The difference you make where you live and where you work and where you play. And we're going to start celebrating those things more. Because when we don't, the temptation is to say, man, my life's a little hard. My kids are going through something I didn't expect. So maybe, maybe those things that it says in Scripture don't apply to me. Maybe everybody doesn't have to practice that. I run into people all the time and they say, Oh, Brother Paul, I'm just kind of a Sermon on the Mount Christian. I'm just going to do those things that Jesus said. I, I just, I just want to be kind to people and loving to everybody. And I want you to be that way. But we don't get to ignore the other parts. When we do, even as well-known church leaders, we walk away from the truth. So this week it, it made national news where that pastor that, man, I've, I've greatly respected for a lot of years. I have a lot of his books. He's, he's shared a lot of wisdom. But this, this pastor in Atlanta, he's... He's hosting a conference for parents of LGBTQ children. And man, that's not a bad thing. Because some of you in here are in that category. And you're living out your faith and you love Jesus and you believe his word. But you've, your, your children or your grandchildren, they've espoused a lifestyle that you know is not consistent with truth and you're, you're struggling. So that's not a bad thing. But in doing that, in, unless they change... Because it's coming up here real soon. And let's say change it. Two of the primary speakers at this conference are, are men who are married to other men. So it's not just how do I minister to you during this season when, when you're doing something, your, your loved one is doing something that's contrary to God's word. It, it becomes more of an affirming of what's being done. That's what happens when you, when you hear God's word and, and yet you don't think, Maybe this isn't perfect, and maybe I don't have to practice that. Oh, parents and grandparents and teachers and, and students, we don't get to choose which parts of God's Word we think apply to us. We have to practice it, and we have to teach it. And parents, I commend those of you who are here, and you're bringing your families to church. But if you're not teaching God's word in your home, where do you think this generation is going to learn it? Jesus reminded us of the person of the scriptures, the perfection of the scripture, the importance of practicing the scripture. And then he ends with the purpose of the scriptures. The purpose. What is the purpose of the scripture? Well, he, he tells us, look down at verse 20, just verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I'm not sure I fully understood that to this week when I dove into this message. Because for a lot of my life, I've heard that and I thought, man, I know, Jesus, you came to give us this new covenant in your blood and we're saved by grace. And yet here, this is you saying, you're not going to make it to heaven unless your righteousness exceeds this. What does that mean? What was, what was Jesus trying to say there? If we read and believe the scripture, this is an impossible task. Perfect righteousness. Was that a mistake on Jesus's part? No, because he says it again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, this is what he says. Be ye perfect, even as my Father in heaven is perfect. So how do we do this? Do we become like the Pharisees that Jesus preached against? We just make sure we're checking all the boxes? Because that's, just be very clear, that's what some of you think. That you're earning or deserving your way into God's kingdom. That you're climbing a spiritual ladder. And that if you take this mental decision to do your best, that that's going to be enough. I've asked people 
all of my life. What do you think it takes for a person to go to heaven? And most people will say something like this. Well, we do bad things and we do good things, but if, if the good things in our life, if, if they outweigh the bad things, then surely God's going to let us in. And so like Pharisees, you just do your best. And then like Pharisees, you become prideful in it. And they were. In fact, you know, do you know what the Pharisees would do when they gave at church? When the Pharisee would bring their offering, they would then do this. Because they wanted everybody to see that they had just given their offering. In fact, you may not know it, but that's where we get you're tooting your own horn. No, Jesus wasn't saying be like the Pharisees. They obviously fell short. In Matthew 23, he's going to describe them. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside area are full of bones and dead of everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. What is a tomb? It's where you bury dead things. And Jesus is applying implying here that the tomb has what we would call a tombstone and then it's been pressure washed. Boy, it looks good. But no matter how good you make a tomb look, all it does is advertise there's something dead under here. And Jesus was saying, that's what the pharisaical life gets you. Righteousness, apart from the righteousness of Jesus, is always glorifying to self. He's not talking about external actions. He's talking about an internal attitude. And that, he says, when you understand that, he says, that's a righteousness better than what the Pharisees have. So how do you get that? (laughs) That's what the whole book is about. The only way you have a righteousness better than the Pharisees is by knowing the person that everything points to. Jesus the Christ. Paul would describe that in Romans 7. He's asked about the law. And so he says, should I say that the law is sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. I would not have known what coveting really was If the law had not said, you shall not covet, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. Apart from the law, sin was dead. In other words, why do we need the law and the prophets? Why do we need the whole book? Because it shows us how much we desperately need Jesus. Because apart from Jesus, we are hopeless against the demands of righteousness. But thanks to Jesus... (laughs) We have righteousness better than the Pharisees. That's what the New Testament teaches us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. He's saying, ultimately, the purpose of all the scriptures, the law and the prophets that I came to fulfill is that you know that there's no other way but through me. But I'm enough. In a world of chaos and confusion, Jesus will always be enough. And the scriptures will always be sufficient. He's saying, there's an old covenant. It was written in stone. But this new covenant, it's written in your heart. There's an old covenant. It was all about do, 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 do this, do that, do this, do that. There's a new covenant. And here's what it says. Done. Everything that needs to be done is done. So just look to me. Is there ever an example in Scripture of anyone who truly got this? Yeah. In fact, I was named after him. Acts chapter 9 says there was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a guy named Saul. 
He was a persecutor of Christians because he didn't like this new way of doing things that they ascribed. He was one bound by the law. But on a trip to Damascus, Jesus himself, the resurrected Christ, appears to Saul. And the Bible says he fell to his face and he saw that it was the Lord. And it changed his life. In fact, it changed his name. He would later write, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All the old things pass away. Everything's become new. So he began to be known as Paul. And the Apostle Paul, inspired by God, wrote a lot of the book that we read. Apart from Jesus, he, he may be the greatest missionary and the greatest church planner who ever walked on the earth. And he speaks to this issue in Philippians 3. He says, if anyone wants to have confidence, I've got reason for confidence. If someone thinks they have reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then he begins to describe his confidence. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Man, that's perfect. Of the people of Israel, yes. Of the tribe of Benjamin, way to go. A Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. But, whatever gains were to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And then his finale. I want to know Christ and be found in him. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him even to death. So somehow obtaining the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, all this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which God has taken hold of me. See, Paul understood how to have a righteousness better than the Pharisees. You got to look to Jesus, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Paul understood that that salvation in Jesus was personal. He said, I. He understood it was powerful. He said, I want to know the power of the resurrection. He understood that it might be painful. There's going to be losses in my life. But he understood it was purposeful. And that's what I want for you, disciple of Christ, on this journey, living it for his glory, making a difference where you are. But it all begins with knowing Christ. Let's bow our heads together. There's really two questions I have for you. Most of us here profess to be followers of Christ. So I ask you, And are you practicing and teaching his word? It's really pretty simple. That, that's the take home for a follower in Christ. Do I believe his word is what Jesus said it was? And so as a result, am I practicing that in my daily life? And am I finding way to teach that to others? Friend, just to be honest, in a room with this many people, it seems abundantly clear that that some of us still just don't get it. And it's not that we're necessarily a bad person. But we're trying to 
have this relationship with God just based on our righteousness. We, we've never put our trust truly in Christ alone. And if that's you, I want to give you the opportunity to change that today. That's what we call salvation. When you understand that Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for the purpose of saving you from your sinful existence and that he lives today so that he can offer you forgiveness and grace. If you've never taken that step, would you consider just calling out to God right now? And you don't have to have words from a pastor. There is no magic prayer. You tell God what you want. The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But maybe you'd pray this. Maybe you'd just say, Jesus... I know I need you. I know I'm a sinner. On my own, my righteous, righteousness will never be enough. But I believe you died for me. And I know you're alive today. So come into my life. Take control. I'm yours. I'm ready to be changed. I tell him thank you. Now I'm going to end this prayer time in a moment, but as our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to challenge you. Don't miss this moment of commitment. We'll be out of here in just a few minutes. But what, what is God wanting you to do to nail this down? Christ follower, you may just want to come and pray and just kneel in front of this room. Treat it like a, a prayer commitment where you're nailing down a stake. I'm going to practice and teach the righteousness of God. But maybe you just prayed that prayer with me and you began this relationship with Jesus. There are going to be pastors from our church standing here. I want you to come and take one of their hands. And just say, hey, I've just accepted Jesus. And they're going to tell you what's next, okay? Lord, I pray that you'd use this time. Our life is filled with distractions. And this room is no different. So, Lord, I pray that you would govern this time, these moments, with your Holy Spirit. May we not miss what you're calling us to do. Lord, if you're calling us to move, would you give us courage to step up out of our seat and walk down an aisle and take the hand of a pastor or kneel and pray. May we not miss what you're asking us to do, Holy Spirit, for our good and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's begin to sing. Christ alone, my hope is found.